Jeep's Grand Cherokee is one of the few American imports to gain a foothold in the British market, in improved third generation form trying to offer something a little different to luxury SUV buyers who'd normally be looking at a Land Rover Discovery, a BMW X5 or a Mercedes M-Class. On paper, it looks like the brand's most credible car yet. Has Jeep ever bought us a fully credible luxury SUV really capable of worrying the prestigious German brands? The company's Grand Cherokee, first introduced in 1992, was always supposed to be that car, but never quite delivered on its promises. Here's a version that does, this much improved third generation variant. Jeep's 70 year heritage certainly helped to sustain sales of this car during the dark days that followed the collapse of the brand's ill-fated alliance with Daimler in 2007. But it's also proved to be quite a hindrance in making this vehicle competitive against the Teutonic competition. People simply don't expect a BMW X5 or a Mercedes M-Class to cut the mustard off road. So it doesn't matter that they talk the talk on tarmac, but fail to walk the walk off it. A Grand Cherokee, in contrast, must be able to tackle the Rubicon Trail, otherwise it wouldn't be a Jeep. Compromise that, and you compromise the brand. Which has always put the engineers behind this car in an awkward situation, mindful as they are that compromise is nevertheless necessary if this car is to match the on-road driving dynamics of ultimately less capable rivals. A car like the second generation Grand Cherokee we saw in 2005 perfectly illustrates the unhappy result these conflicting demands can create. But the Mark III model announced in 2011 was far more competitive. By now the brand was Fiat financed with a much brighter future ahead of it, evidenced by the huge step forward the third generation version represented. Here we had a vastly improved tarmac tool, even though select terrain traction control, a Quadra Track 2 4x4 system and Quadra Lift air suspension all combined to make this an even more formidable tool off-road. And yet, a few rough edges still remained. The cabin still felt crude compared to that of a BMW or Mercedes, nor could running costs live with those of the leading luxury SUVs. And then there was the old fashioned auto transmission offering five speeds where others boasted eight or nine. If Jeep could sort all of these things, then finish the job with a few well judged styling updates, it'd have a very competitive product indeed on its hands. That's exactly what happened when this updated third generation design was launched in the summer of 2013. It's the car we're going to look at here. The current trend amongst the German brands in the luxury SUV segment is to produce models with a sportier feel that sit you slightly lower and create more of an enclosed cockpit like feel behind the wheel. In contrast, this Grand Cherokee is more old school in its approach with its high commanding leather lined perch. It's a lovely place to be if all you want to do is cruise around. You could imagine ambling down California's Rodeo Drive in one of these with the double sunroof open and the sun shining and thinking life couldn't get much better. But of course, day to day living isn't much like that and this Jeep has to face the harsh reality of European buyer expectations that are very different to those in its home US market. Expectations fueled by competition in this segment that really is very strong indeed. Can it really compete? Well, if you've driven the original post 2011 version of this third generation design, you'll know the brand is getting there. Whereas the previous Mark II model had a Mercedes engine and a clunky Jeep chassis, this one reverses that, an in-house power plant sitting on the same underpinnings used for the current Mercedes M-Class, a structure 146% stiffer than before. That last fact, more than any other, explains why the roly-poly slow-witted handling and poor standards of NVH, that's noise, vibration and harshness, that characterised the previous pre-2011 version of this Grand Cherokee have been so dramatically improved in this third generation model. Enough to take the fight to rival German competitors? 
the original version of this Mark III design couldn't quite manage that. I didn't so much mind the fact that it couldn't match, say, a BMW X5 through the twisties. After all, there was superior off-road ability to compensate for that. No, the bigger issues for me in all the Grand Cherokees I've driven before this one have centered around poor refinement and the limitations of old school transmission technology. After all, this third generation Grand was launched with an ancient five-speed auto gearbox. This, remember, in an age where rivals will offer you the greater flexibility and efficiency of eight or even nine speeds. Jeep needed to catch up here. It has. So the headline news with this improved Mark III design is the fitment across the range of an up-to-the-minute eight-speed ZF auto transmission to better manage the VM Motori 3-litre V6 diesel, which in its standard guise now features a slight power hike to 247 brake horsepower. Now it's a Fiat sourced engine, the Italian brand these days owners of Chrysler, Jeep's parent company. Something I mention here only because Fiat are hardly noted for producing whisper quiet large capacity diesel power plants. This one though seems to have been much better muffled in this improved Grand Cherokee and of course doesn't have to strain its way through a limited set of gearbox ratios in the way it had to before. As a result, I'd say this car is now almost on terms with the best of its rivals when it comes to interior hush. And that'll matter on the test drive as much as the leather-lined opulence. Performance is acceptably fleet for this kind of car. 62 from rest appearing in 8.2 seconds, en route to a top speed of 126 miles an hour. Figures that may not quite match the German opposition, but shame those of a Land Rover Discovery. If you don't need to go quite that fast, there's also a detuned 188 brake horsepower version of this same engine on offer in the entry-level Laredo variant, which isn't any more efficient and is quite a bit slower, making 62 miles an hour in 10.2 seconds en route to 119 miles an hour. More significant, perhaps, is the fact that torque in the feebler Laredo model falls from 570 to 440 newton meters, though that's still enough to facilitate the 3,500 kilogram brake towing limit that almost all diesel Grand Cherokee models share. I say almost all because for some reason the figure falls to 2,949 kilograms in the plush top of the line Summit version that I'm trying here. The same as you get in the only petrol model on offer, the Wild SRT8. Now I haven't mentioned this street and racing technology, green pump fueled variant before because very few people will buy it probably because the SRT8 is a car ready-made to endorse every Jeep prejudice you ever had. Big thirsty petrol V8? Check. Sky high running costs? Check. CO2 emissions that'll decimate the polar ice cap on a round trip to the dry cleaners? Check. Those willing to take on the green lobby and run one are certainly going to enjoy the experience though. Power is up to 461 brake horsepower because engine capacity is up from 6.1 to 6.4 litres. It's also got launch control to fire you to 62 miles an hour in 5 seconds dead on the way to a 160 mile an hour maximum that will only be attainable by the very brave. Back to the real world and the diesel models. And before we go any further, I need to point out that there are two distinct levels of four-wheel drive and suspension technology here. The base Laredo and limited variants are the ones most likely to be taken off-road, so it's a touch ironic that they get the less capable of the two all-terrain setups, so-called Quadra Track 2 four-wheel drive mated to conventional coil-sprung suspension. Only if you can afford a really plush version like the one I'm trying here, the top-spec Overland and Summit models, do you get something more sophisticated underneath you, the kind of fancy stuff that you get on a top uh, Mercedes, BMW or Audi SUV. Now Jeep calls its top four-wheel drive setup Quadra Drive 2 and adds an ELSD electronic limited slip differential to it uh, along with Quadra Lift air suspension. So is the more sophisticated of the two setups worth stretching to? After all, whichever Grand Cherokee you choose, you should in theory find it more capable on the rough stuff than anything sharp-suited German SUV rivals can manage. 
Every diesel model uh, provides something they can't offer, a two-speed transfer case with the kind of complete set of low-range gear ratios that all committed off-roaders will want. And all the diesels also get Jeep's clever Select Terrain system, which essentially copies Land Rover's terrain response setup, uh, enabling you to adapt the car to the kind of ground that you're driving over across a choice of sand, mud, and rock modes, plus an auto setting that will adapt the car to any on or off-road situation. It's like uh, having an expert sat alongside you, Certain models even offer the neat option of a select speed control function that allows you to control the speed of the vehicle up or downhill using the steering wheel mounted gear change pedals. All well and good, but what additional capability does a top diesel Grand Cherokee like this one offer with the more sophisticated Quadra Drive, four wheel drive, limited slip rear diff and air suspension package I mentioned earlier? Well, quite a lot as it happens. There are two issues here. One is traction for when you really get stuck, and the other is enough ground clearance to make sure that doesn't happen in the first place. Now let's start with traction. All versions of this Jeep have a drivetrain able to push power between front and rear axles depending on where it's needed. But only the very plushest Quadra Drive diesel models, cars like this one, can go a step further and thanks to an ELSD rear electronic limited slip differential, switch torque between the individual rear wheels as needed too. Now that can make a lot of difference if you're fighting to get yourself out of somewhere really gnarly. But getting into that situation in the first place is usually down to ground clearance or lack of it. Frankly, ordinary Quadra Track equipped Grand Cherokees don't really have that much for what's supposed to be a pretty capable large SUV, sitting just 218 millimeters off the deck. In contrast, the pricier Quadra Drive models with their complementary Quadra Lift Air suspension are very different. With these, should you come across really difficult terrain, a quick flick of the center console controller is all that's necessary to click into the off-road one ride height setting of 254 millimeters. Come across somewhere even more challenging and there's a further off-road two setting that raises it up to 280 millimeters, a mode that'll automatically be activated if you opt for the rock setting on the select terrain system. With off-road 2 activated and the front air dam removed, you can achieve impressive approach, departure and breakover angles of 35.8, 29.5 and 23.5 degrees. Compare that to the respective figures you get without the Quadra lift setup, 26.3, 26.5 and 18.8 degrees. That's quite a difference. That'll all be very useful if you ever find yourself on the Rubicon Trail. But how many owners are really ever going to subject a car this nice to something that nasty? Almost none of them. For these people, the real benefit of stretching to a variant with the more sophisticated mechanicals will come in terms of ride quality. The four corner air springs you get in a top Quadra Lift equipped Grand Cherokee will waft you round town with a magic carpet ride. Drop the car by just over half an inch for optimal high speed cruising and at parking speeds lower it a further inch for easier passenger entry and exit. To make you feel special, which is really what this car is all about. The biggest mistake any Jeep can ever make is to lose its sense of identity. The things that identify its design with a brand heritage remembered fondly for its famed exploits in World War II. So it is that even though this improved third generation model is now more sharply suited, it's still instantly recognizable as a Jeep, thanks to the way that the brand's two most recognizable design cues, the classic squared off trapezoidal wheel arches and the traditional seven slot front grille are both present and correct but they're now included as part of a far more contemporary look with smaller, meaner HID by Xenon headlights leading off what the stylists hope is a more muscular, athletic look emphasised by a steeply raked windscreen and a high waistline. 
Moving rearwards, owners of the original third generation model will note that the front and rear overhangs are still usefully short to aid the approach and departure angles needed for proper off-road prowess. They'll also note a sportier, more elegant appearance emphasised by smarter wheels that can be as large as 20 inch in size. Get to the rear and you'll find bigger tail lamps with LED lighting, a sleeker, more prominent roof spoiler, uh, restyled bumpers and a tailgate that's been re-sculpted to improve visibility. As you'd expect in this class, that rear hatch can be power operated and as usual with this feature, the electric mechanism is painfully slow. Once it does raise, you'll find a very reasonable 782 litres on offer, even though the spare wheel is located inside the car rather than beneath it. Now, that's about the same as you'll find in a Range Rover Sport and about 20% more than you'll get in either a Mercedes M-Class or a BMW X5. There are neat touches too, like a removable torch and uh, a pair of extra storage bins on either side of the spare wheel beneath the boot floor. If you need more room, then the 6040 split folding rear seats flatten to reveal 1,554 litres of fresh air. And inside, well, the dash of the original third generation model offered a big step forward from that of its predecessor, but it still wasn't as classy as the German competition. So the designers in Detroit have tried harder and the cabin ambience you get in this improved version is much closer to the exalted class standard, especially if you choose a top variant like the one I have here with its stitched copper leather, careful use of wood, and suede style A-pillar and headliner covering. The interior is dominated by a couple of large TFT displays, the most eye-catching of the two being the 8.4 inch touchscreen that controls the latest Uconnect infotainment system. Ahead of you is another TFT screen, this seven inch display replacing conventional instruments and driver configurable to show everything from your sat nav setting to the terrain mode that you've selected, as well as the usual dials. Overall, I'd certainly say that the feeling is still quite different from that that you get in an X5 or an M class, but what's changed is that now that's a difference you might prefer. True, if you look a little closer, there are still some hard plastics to be found uh, around the base of the center console, for example. But overall, this is a good effort, offering a more commanding feel than rivals provide. You sit high up, grasping the restyled leather-wrapped three-spoke Jeep steering wheel, and with the exception of pretty thick rear seat pillars, enjoy a great view out, which makes town work pretty straightforward. In the back, the wheelbase increase of 130 millimetres that was incorporated into this third generation design enables it to offer over 100 millimetres more legroom than the Mark II Grand Cherokee, which makes a big difference to a rear seat able to accommodate three adults on shorter journeys or two on longer ones. It can also recline by up to 18 degrees to improve headroom and comfort on longer journeys. So, what kind of luxury SUV is this? These days, the Grand Cherokee is no longer in Range Rover territory, of course, but Chrysler's aim with this third generation version was always to elevate it back into contention with Discoveries and Mercedes M-Class models, maybe even BMW X5s and Range Rover Sports. It's a goal that's proved realistic, or at least it has in Europe, where buyers aren't quite so badge obsessed. But here too, Grand Cherokee sales have been slowly growing, thanks in part to reasonable pricing, which sees the diesel variants selling in the 37 to 50,000 pound bracket. At the foot of the lineup, the low power 188 brake horsepower Laredo base version is intended to appeal to customers who might not have thought they could stretch into a really desirable car of this kind, and were expecting to settle for something like a Volvo XC90 or a Mitsubishi Shogun instead. 
Few will choose it though once they've really bought into the idea of owning a Grand Cherokee and understood the range structure. After all, only a couple of thousand more gets you the proper Pokia full fat version of Jeep's 3 litre V6 diesel with 247 brake horsepower on tap, enough grunt to match the German competition, and Land Rover's Discovery, a car which in base form requires the same kind of £40,000 budget. That kind of money is enough to get you the leather lined limited version of this Grand Cherokee, but most buyers will want the larger wheels and 3D sat nav that are included in the plusher limited plus for another £3,000, which takes you to the kind of budget you'd need for, say, a comparable Volkswagen Touareg 3 litre V6 TDI. Even at that level though, you'll still be paying around £6,000 less than you would be for comparable versions of the main German contenders in this segment. Mercedes M-Class, BMW's X5, Audi's Q7 and Porsche's Cayenne. Of course, Jeep has aspirations to steal sales here too, so it's created two better equipped and more sophisticated Grand Cherokee models, the ritzy Overland and Summit versions, to sell directly against these kinds of cars in the 45 to 50,000 pound bracket. Now, these top Jeep variants get an electronic limited slip differential and a more sophisticated air suspension setup to match the competing Teutonic technology and are trimmed in a way that really does create quite a desirable ownership proposition for the price of something more ordinary or less. After all, even if you choose the nicest Summit model that I have here, you're still looking at a couple of thousand pounds less than you'd pay for an entry-level Range Rover Sport. For completeness here, I'll also mention the only petrol Grand Cherokee variant, the SRT8, with a thumping V8, now uprated from 6.1 to 6.4 litres, and the perfect car to drive if you own your own oil refinery and want to stick two fingers up at the green lobby. It costs around £60,000, is price and performance matched against BMW's much more efficient X5 xDrive 50i and will be a very rare sight indeed on our roads. But let's get back to the real world and consider diesel powered Grand Cherokee motoring. Now it might not be as efficient a proposition as the German alternatives can offer, but this car makes you feel a little more special at the wheel and by and large is much better equipped. Across the range, expect to find smart alloy wheels of at least 18 inch in size, uh, by Xenon HID headlamps, front fog lights, roof rails, a chrome tipped exhaust, power folding mirrors, uh, rain sensitive wipers, an auto dimming rear view mirror, cruise control, a keyless enter and go system, and a Uconnect infotainment setup with an 8.4 inch TFT color touchscreen from which you can Bluetooth link your phone, uh, use voice recognition, and control a stereo system with USB and SD card connectivity. Nearly all buyers will choose the full fat 247 brake horsepower version of the V6 diesel, which will mean that they'll also enjoy leather seats that are heated front and rear, uh, a power tailgate, a reversing camera with parking sensors, and a steering wheel that's heated and electrically adjustable. Of course, the real niceties are reserved for the top of the range with this plush Summit model boasting features like a command view panoramic sunroof, a leather trim dashboard and a Harman Kardon surround sound audio system with 19 speakers and an 825 watt amplifier. Safety kit runs to all the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability, plus an ERM electronic roll mitigation system, tyre pressure monitoring and a trailer stabilisation device. Hill ascent control will help you start off up steep slopes, while hill descent control will allow you to more easily slither down them. There are also multi-stage front airbags and side curtain airbags, as well as supplemental side airbags, a driver's knee bag, and anti-whiplash head restraints. If you want more, you'll need to be looking at the top of the range and the advanced safety technology pack, optional on the Overland variant, but standard for Summit and SRT8 customers. 
This includes a blind spot information system to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another driver, uh, rear cross path detection to stop you from reversing out into the path of another vehicle, advanced brake assist to help in emergency stops, plus adaptive cruise control that automatically regulates your distance to the car in front on the highway and can even slow you to a stop and start you off again if you come across a tailback. Cleverest of all perhaps, there's an FCW forward collision warning system that uses a radar to scan the road ahead for potential collision hazards as you drive. If one is detected and you don't respond or aren't able to, the system will automatically apply the brakes to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. It could make the difference between a narrow squeak and a really bad day. Jeep has gradually been driving down the running costs of this car and has made another step forward here, if not enough of one to match the best of its German rivals. Still, at least CO2 emissions now dip under the important 200 grams per kilometre mark, rated at 198 grams per kilometre for both 188 and 247 brake horsepower versions of the Italian-designed VM Motori 3-litre V6 diesel. That's been enough to drop annual road tax from 620 to 475 pounds a year. Every little helps. The combined cycle fuel consumption is also identical with the two V6 variants, rated at 37.7 miles to the gallon, which is about 10% better than the original version of this third generation model could manage. At motorway speeds, expect to get around 700 miles out of a tank full. Overall, in rough terms, you're looking at figures that are about the same as those of a rival Range Rover Sport 3.0-litre TDV6, and about 15% better than those of a directly competing Land Rover Discovery. Uh, not surprising, since the Disco is about 300 kilograms heavier. In other words, Jeep is back in contention in this class when it comes to running cost returns. All of the figures that I've just quoted uh, assume that you've been driving with what Jeep calls Eco Mode activated. Now, that's a setting added to this improved model that optimizes the transmission shift schedule and tweaks throttle sensitivity to minimize fuel consumption. If you're driving a top diesel variant like this Summit model fitted with quadrilift air suspension, it'll also lower the body at speed to improve the aerodynamics, thereby further improving efficiency. A button on the dash allows you to disengage eco mode for livelier performance. And talking of livelier performance, for the sake of completeness, I should also cover the rather sobering returns offered by the SRT8 V8 petrol variant. 20.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and a smoky 327 grams per kilometre of CO2, which will mean you're paying about a thousand pounds for your first year of road tax. These figures really ought to be better. The BMW X5 xDrive 50i petrol V8, for example, is just as fast and powerful, yet manages 27.2 miles to the gallon and 242 grams per kilometre. To be fair to Jeep, the company has made some efforts to control the prodigious thirst of this Grand Cherokee model's 6.4 litre Hemi V8. It features so-called fuel saver technology which uses only four of the engine's cylinders under light throttle loads. And it was the only engine in the range to be launched in Euro 6 compatible form. Alas, the benefits generated through these two initiatives appear to have been slight. What else? Uh, residual values for the diesel models? Well, you won't expect these to be up to the levels of the German badged competition, and they're not. But Jeep is gradually improving in this regard, as the market appreciates this Grand Cherokee's much improved quality. Insurance groupings, meanwhile, uh, well, they range between 38 and 43 for diesel models, while the wild petrol SRT8 is predictably up at group 50. The warranty, meanwhile, is the usual three-year, 60,000-mile affair. Though over four million Grand Cherokees have already been sold worldwide over two decades, there's little doubt that this version is the most credible yet. Previous models were cars you bought because you liked the Jeep badge and because they had plenty of equipment at a value-for-money price. 
This one is the first to credibly stand wheel to wheel against its German rivals, none of whom can offer a specification to match it on road or the four wheel drive know how to rival it off tarmac. We think it's the best looking car in this segment and it's now got a credibly upper class cabin that at last feels special enough to compete at this level. The technology is now class competitive too and running costs are more acceptable than they used to be. It all leaves us with a luxury SUV that plots something of a middle ground. A Land Rover Discovery might get you a little further off-road. A BMW X5 might feel a little sharper on it. But as a balance between the two, I could see this Grand Cherokee suiting a significant number of buyers in this segment very well, if only they could be persuaded to try it. If it's the little things that make life grand, then it's equally true to say that with this car, Jeep has got more of them right than ever before.